All right, we are going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us for this session of the K-12 Blackboard Innovative Teaching Series. The K-12 Blackboard Innovative Teaching Series is designed to help K-12 educators reimagine education with Blackboard teaching and learning solutions. The K-12 Blackboard Innovative Teaching Series harnesses the power of our K-12 community of academic leaders, teachers, and other experts to provide relevant, real-time, on-demand, and ongoing professional development opportunities for K-12 educators. My name is Sarah Tomchak. Um, you see that Katie Gallagher here is moderating, and actually I will be filling in for her today. So again, my name is Sarah, and I'm a Solutions Marketing Manager on the K-12 team. And um, for this session, I will be leading you. And thank you to Jenny Breister from our K-12 marketing team, who will be helping to answer questions today in the chat. And we will be joining you for the K-12 Blackboard Innovative Teaching Series today, and, and Jenny will be on um, for the remainder of the series as well. We're always open to new ideas for topics for this series, and please let us know if you are interested in presenting in a future session. And you can either email myself or Jenny Breister. Um, that is included here, those emails. Each webinar in this series will be recorded, and as you heard, the recording button has been pushed. Um, if you're looking for a session, just search for the K-12 Blackboard Innovative Teaching Series playlist on the Blackboard TV YouTube channel, or you can go to the bit.ly uh, that's there on the slide. You'll, you will receive the recording and presentation slides a few days after each webinar by email. In addition, you will also receive an invitation to participate in a professional learning community on course site that's designed to augment the series and create an avenue for ongoing collaboration and dialogue. Please be sure to accept this invitation and participate in this new online PLC. As you can see, we have many exciting professional development sessions lined up. Please be sure to join us on Monday, March 30th while kicking down the doors of online learning collaboration among teachers with James Bell from North Carolina Virtual Public Schools. To register for the entire bid session, you can go to bbbb.blackboard.com backslash k 12 bit to register for all the sessions within the series. And then be sure to download um, our bbk 12 Live app for more professional development on demand. And with that, I'm really happy um, to introduce you to both Kyle and Terry, who are going to take us through building a digital district today. Um, do I have you both on the line? Uh, Kyle still is in that uh, problem there. <laughs> OK, no worries. Then Terry, what I'll do is I will hand over the reins to you, and if you just want to give a high-level overview um, of your presentation today, and then um, we'll go ahead and get started. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Kyle and I are, are the only two in the instructional technology for our whole district. We're in Cecil County, Maryland. Uh, and as you all know, if you work K-12, to that sometimes your superintendent comes to you that morning and says you have something you have to complete, and that's where Kyle is right now. So hopefully he'll be joining us. But I'm a technology coach for Cecil County Public Schools. Um, we are located in between Baltimore and Philadelphia. So we're on that I-95 corridor. But we're still a little bit more rural than some of those to kind of get an idea or capture what we are. We have, as a district, 17 elementary schools, six middle schools, five high schools, and one school of technology. And we work as a district. So whatever one school is doing, they're all doing. So you can see what the size of our population is and where our faculty numbers are. So it's a little bit out of whack that there's only two of us. But you'll get the idea of why we went to Blackboard um, to try to solve some of these numbers problems. Um, when we first sat down with Blackboard, actually, let me back up a little bit. We sat down with Angel first uh, because it was a much uh, price point was better at the time. And then when Blackboard and Angel merged, the price point became much better. 
So we sat down with Blackboard with this is their roadmap, and we sat down then and figured out what we would need to do. So I'm going to spend a major portion right now just talking about this slide. Um, our first jaunt onto our online learning was through MSDE, which is the Maryland State Department of Education. Um, they were currently using at that time Desire to Learn, and we could buy certain things or we could get space in D2L. Um, and as we started to grow, we realized that we were soon outpricing or outspacing what the State Department could afford. So we went to look for other alternatives. And we started with Moodle Rooms on our own. Um, inside of Moodle Rooms, it was cheap to begin with. It was a dollar a student, so it was very easy to get uh, enough money to enroll kids. Um, we started off with 10 professional development courses. Some of them were courses that MSDE had created and we could convert over. Some of them were ones we created ourselves, and I'll show you what they look like as we move on. But we, at that time, had 2,200 students that were in blended learning experiences. Now, that meant all 6th graders were in a computer lit class that was blended learning, and all 12th graders were in a contemporary world studies class that was blended learning. So that was our initial rollout as we rolled out through this. Now, both of these courses, we started with the year prior to this, one teacher and one classroom so that they, we built some content. The next year, we went whole district-wide with the whole thing so that the content was there for that particular group. And then we needed to make a decision as to how we were going to move everyone else in the district along. So we have these 1,400 people that we had to move along. So the first thing we looked at was different tracks. First, we needed something for curriculum. We also needed something for our teachers to learn how to use this. And then we needed something for uh, the content for the kids to use. So I'm going to break those down into two different areas. So our targeted use first was looking at uh, learning communities for math and uh, social science. Um, basically, we were looking at some of our STEM money and how we could use it to bring along some teachers. Um, that was a very small pilot, and as we've moved forward this year, everybody receives some sort of PD through Blackboard with us. All of our teachers get some sort of PD. Um, the curriculum management, we had, I don't know if you all have these same rooms where you have hundreds of notebooks of curriculum sitting in somebody's office for the whole county. We realized that, that only one or two people could get to see it, so we needed to go to some kind of digital curriculum. Uh, so one of the things that Blackboard intrigued us about Blackboard was the content collection. Because it was a place that we could put it that everybody could then read it or see it. So for instance, if you're an elementary teacher and you're teaching reading, math, social studies, science, you didn't have to go find five different coordinators' websites. It could all be housed in the one content curriculum. And then as we build online courses or blended learning courses, we then can pull from that content curriculum place, and then we know we always have the latest and the greatest. So that kind of helped us along, too. So it was a good sale for us um, to our superintendent and our assistant superintendent because we were trying to find ways to deal with problems we were already having. And district curriculum was one just because it was housed in so many different places and in so many different methods. Um, the next thing we needed to do was professional development. So we have 1,400 people. On a professional day, it's hard to bring that many people together. So through Blackboard, we were able to connect the entire or teachers together during those professional days. That was another sale that we had to try to sell to uh, people that people could learn through the online learning. Um, so we looked at some of those. We looked at PD in several ways. We have several PD courses that are for credit, meaning that the Maryland State Department of um, Education will allow credit, CPD credit, which is our continuing ed credit uh, for some of our courses, and those are done beyond the duty day. We have some PD that is self-serve that you go get when you need something. There is a whole course on self-serving. And then we have PD courses that are used during our professional days. So those were things that we had to create. Now, in order to do all of those things, we had to back-end people and try to get them to learn how to use a content management system, how to teach online, how to start putting stuff online. And that's basically what my job is, is to keep moving the district forward in that role. Um, 
what some of the uh, people at our central office wanted, however, they also wanted stuff for grade recruit, home and hospital, alternative placement. So they had a distinct thing that they want. So everybody wanted different things. We know Blackboard can deliver it. So our goal right now is to make sure that we can try to deliver all of these in some kind of systematic method that will make sense to everybody as we move along. Um, the good part is, is some of our goals we have reached. Um, one of our goals is we want every student to have access online. That is not reached yet. Um, currently, we have um, several courses online, and we're bringing more online next year. Um, but we're trying to get every course to have some kind of online component. Now, how we did that is we combined uh, Google Apps for Education with Blackboard this year for the first time. And it's helped move us along tremendously. Because the teachers see the need for having digital content. Blackboard is our way to deliver that digital content. And then we're using Chromebooks for the kids to be able to access it in school. So our Chromebook pilot this year started as something very small. Uh, we have two um, uh, English language arts teachers in each of our schools using um, Blackboard and Google Apps for Education. Next year, we are going to move it forward so that all middle school social studies and ELA, English language arts, will have access to Chromebooks and a Blackboard shell, which then they can alter. And I'll show you what some of our shells look like. But that is the goal that we're trying to reach for, to give those kids 24-7 access to things that they might want. Um, another goal that's still in progress is our advanced courses. Um, we still have, the state of Maryland, you have to have uh, a completely online course certified through the State Department. To be blended, it has to be 80% or less online. So most of our stuff is blended so that we don't have to go through the State Department to get it approved. Um, but we can use some of the courses that they already approve and import them in. And that's what we're looking for for our advanced placement courses for next year is uh, content that we can pull in so that we don't have to create everything. And then we could also use it as a completely online course if we need to. Um, some of our other goals have been that every teacher participates online. And I'll show you both of those models of how we've used every teacher has done some online professional development at this time. Um, we still have some problems with some people that don't like it. So we've tried to work around it in some ways. And I'll show you a couple of those. And then we have people that absolutely love it because they can keep going back for what they need. And that's kind of the way we've sold it, that if people keep going back, if you have a face-to-face, it's pretty much one and done. I mean, you can email the person, but you can't see it again. Where if it's online, then you can keep going back and getting it over and over again. So this is kind of the roadmap that we sat down with our uh, Blackboard consultant at the time and kind of worked at where we wanted to be or where we were and where we wanted to be. So you kind of get an idea of where we're going just looking at that. Um, some of the uh, keys to our success was we were very focused. We had had a long-range technology plan. And Blackboard was definitely part of the infrastructure. It was a necessity in order to uh, facilitate our long-range plan. Uh, we had to find a way to have the teachers be learners. Um, they, first, they needed to start out as a student in Blackboard, and then they needed to continue on as a learner. And our students coming, our, our teachers coming in, most of them have had Blackboard experience as a student. So that was a plus. It was more for our teachers who have been 25 plus years, who haven't already, who haven't gone back to school in a while, that we needed to figure out how to get them on board. So keys to our success were bringing them on board slowly and in a uh, pace that they could handle. And we use some of the Blackboard courses that uh, Blackboard creates. And I'll show you one of those um, that helped us bring the teachers online without having to create everything. So we tried to use as much content from other places as we could um, to facilitate so that I didn't have to do everything. Um, we also had to bring along our curriculum uh, coordinators. So we had to teach them why they'd want to put stuff in a digital manner and where it could go and why we'd want it in the content collection because it can be pulled in all different places. So we had to get traction from them. And once we got traction from the content coordinators, it took off very fast. Because um, we have this philosophy in Cecil County that it is um, instruction that drives technology. You know, I'd love to bring in the Chromebooks, but we had to have instruction say, we need access for this 
and then it was easier to move forward. So some of those things were important to us. Um, being able to uh, leverage um, the strategic planning from Blackboard helped us a lot. The final piece was definitely the Google Apps for Education with the Chromebooks because it helped us get access for every kid then in a much cheaper manner because at the time before that we were using desktop machines and obviously our classrooms weren't set up to have everyone a lab. So that helped us a lot with Chromebooks. Um, so now we're looking at a new cycle and how do things work and how do we go from here. So we're going to demo a couple of courses just so that you get an idea of what I'm talking about. And then I'll answer some questions when we're all done. But we have currently 274 classes running inside of Blackboard. That covers 76 courses. So we may have an eighth grade course that goes for 50 classes, just so they get the idea of what the numbers are. But we have over 7,300 of our almost 1,600 kids participating right now inside of Blackboard. We currently have 18 online professional development courses, and all of our teachers are uh, inside of Blackboard. So let me give you a demo of what it kind of looks like. So the first thing you're looking at right now is the content collection. Now, this is a separate purchase from Blackboard, but it was well worth our money. So in the content collection, and I'm just going to scroll down so you can see that there's content from all different things inside of here. Why they're in separate folders is because we could give different permissions to different content coordinators. So for instance, this is the elementary mathematics folder. Only the content coordinator, her secretary, and whoever else she dubs can put stuff in here has access to put stuff in this folder. Everybody else can read it unless they change the permissions on a folder. And then we set them all up the same way. We sat down with all the content coordinators and said, what makes sense? So we set them up in a certain way. So they are all inside of there, have their grades. And then they're all broken down by units. So everything for math in second grade for unit two is all in this folder. We then had to sit down with our content coordinators and we explained the difference between the permissions for assessment folder versus some of the other folders. For instance, we are quite OK if any student gets in and sees our curriculum documents. More power to them if they're looking to see what we have. However, the assessments, we don't really want them to have access to because we don't want them studying at home beforehand. So we had to teach the permission set to our um, coordinators and their secretaries. That was one step of our training. But the content, uh, the content, excuse me, the content collection is such a need for the classes because once I put something in here and link it into a class, if I find a spelling mistake and I change it at the content curriculum, it changes everywhere inside of our domain. So that was an asset to start with was the content collection. We also have inside the content collection um, several things that everyone can use. And this is where we are moving to with the content collection. So we have a, a folder called Course Resources. And inside of here are things that anybody can use in any course. So for instance, we purchased the In Plain English uh, series of videos. Um, all of these are the pages with the embedded video that a, a teacher can put into any one of their classes that they're teaching. We also have common rubrics. So we wanted to have a rubrics folder so that anybody that was doing a discussion rubric in the middle school would know exactly what um, the discussion rubric that everybody else was using. So it gave them a way to kind of standardize for the kids what they were learning and how they would be graded. So by having these up here in the content collection, any of the teachers can come in here, add it to their course, and use it if they're looking for a rubric to build, course, to build inside their courses. So that to us was why the content collection was so powerful, because it connected all of our teachers. Um, then looking forward, we have different stages of where our classes are. Um, you'll all know you've all built classes at some point in time inside of a um, learning management system, and everybody sees stuff differently. But as we move forward in this process, we realize that we need to have some kind of consistency to make it easier for our kids. So as you take a look at, this is an older course, but I wanted to bring it back so that you could all see some of the stuff. This is a very long left-hand margin. It's very hard for the kids to follow where some of the content was. Um, so we 
started taking a look at what our, our heavy hitters, our people that started out of the gate with us were doing, and then trying to figure out a way to make it manageable for kids to understand where they were going. So from that process, we learned a couple of things. We learned, A, that our teachers need um, certain things all of them need. They all needed this year Google Apps for Education uh, help that their kids could get to. They all needed Blackboard help that the kids could get to. So there's certain things that we needed to build that's one piece in every course that the kids could go get help from. We also learned that we needed to start talking about the tools because for our sixth grade, if you introduced every single tool that was available inside of Blackboard, they wouldn't have learned any of them. So we started taking a look at which tools we offer which years so that the kids learn to build discussion. Then they'll learn to build journal and blogs and wikis so that it's, it's a step-by-step -step process instead of, oh, let's use them all, and then the kids have trouble following some of them. So therefore, by the time they got to the high school, then they would be ready to use all the tools. But if you'll take a look at some of this, we found this a lot. You may have a folder with a whole bunch of stuff in it, or somebody may have built, built a folder with a whole bunch of stuff on the outside. Well, using a Chromebook, that's a lot of scrolling and a lot for somebody to find. So we started saying, well, what is best practices that we can use inside of Blackboard? Where we're working on right now is we're working to build master shells so that we can deliver this to every uh, teacher. So what I've pulled up right now is the eighth grade language arts that'll be for next year. We're currently building this master, and then we integrate our PowerSchool with Blackboard so that it feeds one way. There's a file feed that literally says, here's all the sections of PowerSchool that has eighth grade, and it makes a Blackboard course automatically for us. And then it also takes our students, and automatically today they're enrolled in PowerSchool, Tomorrow morning after the file feed tonight, they'll show up in your Blackboard shell. So that's an automatic process for us, so that helps our teachers not have to think about some of the other pieces behind it. Now what we're trying to build for next year then is this is the technology hub that I was talking about that will be in every class. This is from the teacher perspective, so it's still the editing is on, but you ha have the idea. There's Blackboard help if they need it. Our acceptable use policy is right up in front. We wanted connections right to our digital databases with all of our passwords inside for home use because this is behind a password so we can put all of the passwords to the other digital databases inside of here. Uh, we talk a little bit about the, uh, the Flip Classroom. We're talking a little bit about Google Help and Grand is our, the way we introduce Netiquette for our particular kids this year. But that then will go in every class that we have next year. Then we've set them up by marking periods so that every single class has their marking period and that's where they'll find their content. And now what we're trying to do is decide on which tools we're going to use which year so that we can hide them so when the master comes, um, there's only what they're supposed to be using is shown. Obviously, if they have a group of exceptional kids, they're there, they can add them to do whatever they want with. Um, then the other thing we've done with English language arts is we've set a teacher resource that will always be hidden. But the reason we did that is because there are things, so all of our English language teachers do not teach the same novel at the same time. So we couldn't put them in a unit because we didn't know where they would actually fall. So what we've done is we've put them into novel ideas, and this will be everything for Treasure Island. So the teacher then, when they're ready to use it, simply has to move it to whatever unit they're going to actually use Treasure Island. But it will house everything that the teacher needs for that particular book. Um, some of the things will be, and this is still a work in progress, teacher resources, so that'll be hidden, that'll be things just for the teacher to know, that may be in-class lesson plans, things of that nature. Um, then there's also places wherever they can find it online, so Lit2Go has a version of Treasure Island they could read online or let it read to them if they wanted to, and then the assessment is there. And then there'll be other ideas inside of there um, that will have different items. So, for instance, this is the World of Change, which is a literal blackboard um, assignment for these kids that takes them step by step through an entire project of World of Change. And this is revolving around the ELA standards um, and some of the technology standards as we move forward. Um, so that's our eighth grade class. We also have computer lit classes as we move along. And we took the same philosophy with them. We just didn't call them by units because they're in chunks of time 
So for instance, financial literacy, we look at through the eyes of a middle school years. What do you need to think about financial literacy then through high school years, through early college, along those lines. So those are some of the courses that we've created. And they've kind of run the gamut from some of this one was imported from Moodle. And we had a lot of cleanup. to the one that I just talked about first was one we're building from what other people have done and importing them in. So we're thinking that this is going to be the best of the both, both worlds. We just got to take the time to build it. And that's probably what all of you are saying. Where do you find the time? And it's, it's a win-lose situation. We just find time where we can. So those are our student courses that we're looking at right now. Now remember, we have 274. So that was just a snapshot of some of them. Um, if we move forward, I talked about when we were looking at our roadmap, how we got to where we got to. Um, one of the places that helped us was the classes that you can purchase from Blackboard themselves. I think we purchased seven or eight of them. I don't remember which one. The one that we start everyone in is the Getting Started in Blackboard Learn. And it really, the first two lessons, walk them through as a student. What are the things they need to be able to do as a student? The last three lessons really teach them they have an, another uh, shell where they are a teacher and they can practice doing some of these things, practice writing an announcement. So they get the feel of what it's like to be inside of Blackboard. And from there, we purchased several others. One of them is on communication, where they learn to use some of the communication tools. We've used that a lot with our ELA and social studies teachers. Um, we have one on assessment so that they learn how to use the assessment tool. And again, we've purchased these all through Blackboard um, for a, a fairly small fee from, the, from what Kyle and I see because it helped us move forward so much quicker than me having to create all this. And every time we've gone up to a new version, uh, Blackboard has given us the new version of the, those particular classes. So this is one of the ways that we started. Another way that we move forward then is we did have to create some of the PD ourselves. Um, and this is, we are, um, have a partnership with the University of Kansas and Jim Knight, where he has the different routines, the unit organizer, the course organizer, concept comparison. Um, so we took some of those items and we put them to an online class. Now these type of PDs are for credit. This one I believe is a one credit course, which it means about 15 hours of work. Um, they come together for a face-to-face, -face, or if they can finish the face-to-face -face stuff before the certain date, they don't have to come. That means they already have the skills necessary uh, to succeed in the class. But these literally are set up the same way, where literally you have the checklist for the entire unit, all the tasks that are in there and the assessment will be in the task part. So those are the way we set up some of our first online learning uh, PDs. Now this one is about two years old and as I look at it, there's things I'd like to do a little bit differently, but sometimes we've um, said that it's acceptable so that we can move on. Um, one of the other PDs that we did kind of like getting started was Blackboard has a course creation class and all of our coordinators took that class after taking Getting Started um, and two other courses uh, to learn how to start putting content in. So when I sit down and work with a content coordinator, they have some basic knowledge of how Blackboard works, how they can put stuff in themselves. And usually I'm just troubleshooting for them at this point. Um, some coordinators are a little farther than others, but you get the idea of how those have helped. Now, moving forward, we had to think of some other ways for our professional development. So you notice we have 17 elementary schools. Um, when we want to have countywide PD, there's almost no way to pull all of them together at one spot. So what we've started doing this year is using Blackboard as our classroom, and they stay in their home school. So they have an agenda very similar to what they would have um, if it was a face-to-face. And all of this stuff is linked to different items in Blackboard. Now, there are a few items that will be um, teacher-led in their own school. So we had people literally um, come in, probably two from each school, come in for a little bit of training for a half day to learn how to do some of the stuff that needed to be face-to-face -face because we didn't want them to be sitting in front of videos all day. So we had two of those. But then they all walk through the same thing. So for instance, um, in the resource exploration, they had to um, 
explore different UDL resources. And then during this planning gallery walk, they had to go back to their own classroom and find things that they've already done that is considered UDL, put it out in their classrooms, and then the whole school went on a gallery walk to see what each teacher put out. Because we wanted to show them that they were already doing some things that were UDL. They just need to understand um, that UDL is just it's more than one thing, but they're doing some of it already, so they weren't or excuse me, overwhelmed with it. So that gave them some ideas. And then obviously we have a discussion across the county. So all first grade were in one discussion, all second grade were in another discussion, but across the county of what they saw for UDL. Now some of our PD sessions, it wasn't grade level specific, it was school specific, even though they were in the same school, because then the principals at those schools could go back and look at where his teachers were in one group. So his discussion may have just been his school. And then he could see where this school was in UDL because they had a big online discussion and you could see what all the teachers said. So we've done it in several different ways as that moved on. But this is the way we've done most of our PD this year. And all of this stuff is literally in these two sessions. But we had people that couldn't follow it, so then we created the table more thing that will actually jump them in and out of Blackboard where they need to be. So that's one of our types of professional development. Now, secondary schools handled professional development completely different for UDL. They wanted something that was all online, that the teachers could do during their planning periods. So we built a completely online section or section of UDL. So when they came into their different sections, they had different a lot of times, they would come in here, they would follow exactly which parts they had to do, and you'll notice these are the three big parts of UDL. So each teacher in session one signed up for one of the big topics, whether it was representation, action or expression, or engagement. So they only had to do one, and you'll see on my end where it's adaptive release because only people who had picked that particular one we'll see representation. So we use the group feature there, and that was something new for a lot of our teachers. But hey, mine doesn't look like theirs because you're in a different group. So we use the group feature so it didn't overwhelm them, and they would only see which one they wanted. And then inside of all of these, there were different tiers for uh, novice, apprentice, and practitioner so that not everybody got the same thing. They got what they needed already built in. Now this does take time to build, but once we started building it, then we found we could use some of these components inside of our elementary PD because it, they're similar items. So it gave the ideas of across the board what you could use. And they've taken a different stance to this. So if you'll notice on the left-hand side of this particular course, these are pretty much general topics that we use for all secondary teachers. Where if you look at the elementary one, because we have a different set of content coordinators that are in charge of it, they did UDL, but then they really departmentalized. And this, this one started first, and I think they realized there's so much overlapping that they wish they had set it up differently. So those are some of the things that we're looking at with ongoing PD. How do we set up those courses so that they can still find information um, and that it's usable for the next time? that they'll use over and over again. Uh, the last one I want to highlight, and I think I must have closed it, so let me come back over here and open up to it. Is our toolkit. Our toolkit, CCPS toolkit, is our self-serve professional development for our teachers. So these are the big things that we are going through right now. Um, Blackboard is obviously one of them. I'm trying to make them as um, um, self-serving as possible. So if you're teaching a course, how do I? And sometimes I link to a specific video from Blackboard, but sometimes we've changed some of our settings so that the videos would be harder to find on the Blackboard site. So we've created our own um, videos to show for some of these things. So if this is their self-serve place of where they can come to find all these particular items. Um, inside of here, this is, a, this is a harder one to build because you have to watch how many people need access to building it. 
and who you trust to build in it without deleting everybody else's stuff. So for instance, I back this course up regularly because when special ed came in to put all of their stuff inside of here, one of them accidentally deleted all of our smart stuff. Well, I had had it backed up so it was easy to replace. But then we had to sit down with them and explain to them um, why it's important to kind of only work in your area. And if it says delete, really think hard what you were deleting. But these are some of the things that they've needed help with. So this is really where their self-service comes in into our um, CCPS toolkit. And some of this stuff is the same exact videos that we use for kids. So for instance, inside of our Google section, this may be something where we want all the kids to know how to use Read Write for Google along with the teachers. So this would be something that's built up at the content collection level and then just pulled in to each course that we need it. And that way, because last night, Read Write for Google changed this icon. As soon as we can get some videos from some place that show the new icon and how it works, then we can just change them at the content level and it'll change in all these courses. So by starting to really hit hard with the content collection, the coordinators and the other Department of Education are, for us are understanding why it's important to have that one level and pull it all in. Um, so those are kind of the topics that we have, really, is the um, PD, the student courses, and then some of the self-serve courses. Let me pull back. So from with all of that, you saw some of the classes that we have, some of the courses, and some of the professional development that we're currently using. This is an ongoing process. It will be something that we um, continually work on because it's an ever-changing um, world and Blackboard is always putting in new things that we have to go, oh, that's a good tool. Now we're going to try to change it this way. Um, and where we're really working right now is with some of the assessments to try to get uh, the questions asked that we want and the um, data output that we want. So with that, um, I'm going to take some questions and answers just in time for my cohort, Kyle Rickensrud. He just walked in. Um, so I will Hello. leave it open for questions. Thank you so much, Terry. That was extremely informative. It looks like we did receive um, one question in the chat. Um, Hildy was asking, are the assessments in rubrics documents or Blackboard rubrics and assessments? And she posted that pretty early on in your demo um, when you were talking at the institution level content. It was the very first tab that you showed. Um, usually our rubrics... Please specify the ones in the content collection. Oh, yeah. Usually in the content collection we have um, both. We have a, a Word doc or Google doc that has a rubric. So if people want to print it out, it makes it easier to print out and we talk about it because that's the way we started to build them. But then there's also the Blackboard rubric. That's the zip folder that's up there so that they can just pull it into the course and it works as um, part of the grading content. I think I answered that question, Sarah. Great. I'll leave that answer your question for you. We'll let her. Yes, it did. She said, thank you. Um, and I actually have a question for you, Terry. What have your um, student and teacher responses been um, to the different courses that you've built out? Do you want to answer that? Hello, my name is uh, Kyle, and thank you for putting up with me coming late to the party. Uh, now, you said what are the responses from the students and the teachers in the courses in which we build out? Is that the question? Exactly, yeah. So what are the reactions then? specifically for teachers to the professional development? Um, what are their reactions? And then students um, in these blended learning environments, how are they responding to that personalized learning? I think it's, it's interesting to have the conversation, um, at least from the teacher's perspective, for the ones that are just getting started and the ones that have been doing it for a while. Uh, because what happens is that their understanding and their comfort 
um, certainly uh, influences what their opinion is, and it evolves over time. So, like the you know the first time that when we build these shells, that I think number one is is a critical uh, support mechanism, especially for those folks that are just getting out of the gate and knowing what to do. Um, but and that obviously builds that comfort level, and they do enjoy it. But yet there's some angst because um, they're still trying to figure it all out. I think the most experienced teachers that we have are absolutely just loving the fact of what we've built and their ability to customize really quickly. Um, and again, because these courses are kind of like an evolution over time, um, that we keep putting together the best pieces of the courses and iterations over and over and over again. These these courses have become very mature and um, really provides that that framework and that backbone for those experienced teachers really take off with it. Um, and you know, one of the one of the eighth grade teachers that are doing in a, a blended classroom um, with his kids, that is our more experienced, says as far as the class participation, the homework turn in, and all those kind of things that typically are the struggle that they face on a day to day basis are essentially non existent mm -hmm. in in the in this hybrid setting because the kids are so engaged and ready to go. And, and again, because he also takes that time to customize the content we've built and really put that engaging um, you know, content that the kids are really going to be in tuned into, really, again, adds that layer of excitement of wanting to participate and wanting to do. Does that make sense? It does, and I think that that's a great point that you made there at the end, that, that you're offering, you know, the shell for them, but then they know their students best and they're able to go in and customize the course and add a unique spin and, and twist to it. So I love that it's not just cookie cutter. So that's, I think that's just a great point. Um, Ron from Bishop Lynch just typed in the chat, um, did you get any pushback from content owners who are used to having their own websites on which they house their content when you ask them to move to and, the And I board. think that kind Great of question. goes along with what Kyle was saying. We don't, they're teachers in their class, they're an instructor, so they can add whatever they want inside of there. So we don't just house them with just the shell we have, they can add whatever they want. So most of them already had stuff that was digital, so it's just a matter of uploading it into the Blackboard shell. And now that they realize, because we've been showing them um, how to export their class, that they can import it again next year, the components that were theirs that they want to use again. Um, but what we really try to push them to do is share it with your content coordinator so that they can put it in the shell for next year for everybody, mm -hmm. because then we get a, a variety of things, so go back to the Treasure Island example, we might have eight different things in there that you can do. You're not going to do eight things, but it gives you some ideas of some uh, things that you can do inside or using Blackboard, using Google Apps for Education, using any of those things. Most of the pe people who were um, using their own content someplace else were so happy with all the different choices they had in Blackboard, they had no problem coming over to Blackboard. And Ron, I'm going to dovetail with it. Um, right. And, and coming from and then, that, hold on, I want to come from, coming from that district idea, the district perspective. I think um, as far as the websites go, it really determines or really is based upon how the teacher is using the website. You know, if it is here, go get my information. Um, and then you go do it independently, or is it just if the website is being used as just a content delivery model, then um, that's where you got some of that, I guess, if you say pushback because the teacher isn't using any other tools to enrich their classroom. You know what I mean? So we didn't have a lot of those issues because what we found was is the teachers were looking for additional tools to bring into their classroom rather than just here's a link to go to or here's a PDF file or a Word document download so you can edit. You know, they were looking for those additional uh, ways for kids to interact with one another in the classroom. And so we didn't really get a lot of pushback in that in that regard. Um, you know, so we you know we're not a hundred percent by any stretch of the means, but it is uh, a certainly a continued work in progress and I know that Terry touched upon it earlier about how this dovetails right within our, um, you know, our 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 
device deployment plan really really brings everything to kind of a nice, beautiful, uh, beautiful cycle. It's actually working out very well. And I think one more thing to note on that was um, our teachers quickly realized that a lot of them were using just like regular websites and they were posting things that they could have gotten in trouble with copyright. So this made it much easier. We own the stuff, we can post it, but it has to be behind something that has a password protection. So they were quite happy with the things that they could now post because it was all behind a uh, username and password. So we really did not have uh, any kickback at all. That's great. Yeah, those are all excellent points. And Ron, do you feel that they, I feel like they touched on your second question. Um, did they actually upload digital content or did they just put a link on Blackboard to their own personal website? Um, it, it sounds as though you didn't have teachers that were doing that because they really embraced the tool for, for what it is. Great. Do we have any additional questions for either Kyle or Perry? Okay, it doesn't look like anything's coming in the chat, so we'll go ahead and wrap up here. Just one more reminder that you can download the Blackboard K-12 Live app for Android and iOS devices, or simply search Blackboard K-12 Live in the App Store. If you have any questions or you'd like to present, um, you can reach out to Katie Gallagher or myself, um, the email that was at the beginning of the presentation, and we are happy to incorporate you um, into the series moving forward. And as a follow-up, we will be sure to send you um, this presentation information, so be on the lookout for that email, and we'll be inviting you to the professional learning community as well that you can take on course based. And again, please be sure to join us on Monday, March 30th for Kicking Down the Doors of Online Learning, Collaboration Among Teachers with James Bell. You can go to bbbb.blackboard.com backslash tableflitfit to register for the, for the session. Um, and for the series. So thank you again, um, both Terry and Kyle. Kyle, so glad you were able to join us here at the end. You guys did a fantastic job. I learned so much just about your districts and keep up the great work. We really appreciate you being on today.